Today's presentation is about why you should be practicing law. And if you're listening to this, the odds are probably pretty good that it's something that you've thought about. And if it hasn't something that you've thought about, then it may be something uh, that you should think about. One thing I can say that it is not a good reason to practice, uh, quit practicing law. And I'll just say this at the outset is if you think it's difficult to get a job or you think you're, you're not doing it as well as other people and getting the highest salary jobs and so forth. Cause it's actually, in my experience, when people apply to BCG, most people are people that we could place if we have the resource to work with them, which we actually do. But the point is that you, know, you, you can definitely get jobs. And so that's not a good reason to quit practicing law. But th there are reasons uh, that you should quit. And there's a lot of things to think about when you're entering into this. And I know that one of the problems that most people have when they're practicing law is that th there's so much pressure they feel like just to stick with the job and they feel like they, they really can't quit. They, they, they think that they have to stay engaged and, and, and keep doing the work and that if they quit, that there's something wrong with them. And so there's a lot of peer pressure. It comes from parents. It comes from the sense of achievement that has gone into becoming an attorney and a lot of other factors, I think, motivate people to want to stick with it. But the thing I really need to tell you is that if you practice in law, most attorneys end up doing far better in other professions than they would practice. And I'll just tell you, for example, I purchased a pickup truck about a week ago. And when I was there, I was talking to uh, the salesman and he was telling me that he's 19 years old and makes $300,000 a year. And this is fair. And he says that most of the half of the people that he works with make that. So the point is that you can make a lot of money doing other things. You can make money selling cars. You can make money in real estate. You can make money owning different sort of businesses. I once knew a guy that cleaned windows and only did four or five months a year in Michigan and made hundreds of thousands of dollars. So it shouldn't be about money that drives you in, and you shouldn't believe that if you uh, take what you practice in law and do something else, you're not going to do well because the odds are you'll do very well with your smarts and motivation that led you to go to law school in the first place if you try other things. And frankly, the law is a very crowded field. And I'm an example of someone that quit practicing law. I'm still in the profession, but at the same time, I, I, I quit and a lot of people quit. And one of the things I'll just tell you at the outset is I see a lot more people quit and never come back to practicing law than I see people quit and go back. And there are certain people that are natural fits for practicing law. And if you're one of those, uh, then you definitely should not quit. And we'll talk about that uh, today. Many attorneys, by the time uh, they get out of law school, are just really exhausted. And, and there's just a lot of high pressure. There's Before you go to law school, uh, most people, they, they work very hard in, in high school, a lot of times getting good colleges, or they work very hard in colleges to get into good law school or they just end up working very hard in law school. And it's a lot of pressure and, and they're often very burned out and, and tired. And in a lot of cases, they've lost a lot of their spirit. It's a uh, law school can be very crushing. It's there's constant rejection, uh, no matter where you go to law school and no matter how well you do, you could be the best student in the world and not get jobs because of your personality, or you could be a bad student. And it's just so much. So one of the things that, that happens is I think a lot of attorneys, when they especially ones that go to big law, law firm, law schools and do well there and get, get jobs with big law firms. Uh, a lot of times they're very excited by the time they get out and they believe that it's their time to collect a paycheck. It's their time to, you know, start working and living life on their terms. And, and, and they're almost uh, ready to, to not work hard anymore, even though everything is just start you, you, the fact that you have to start working hard, it's actually, you have to start working even harder, uh, when you get out, than you were to, to even get in the door. But a lot of people think the opposite and, and they fall fairly quickly. And then a lot of times, even before they start jobs with large law firms, I do these presentations every week and law students are always on them and ask questions about going in house, even when they're in, when they're a big, big, very prestigious law school. So. Uh, a lot of people dream of going in house very early. And, and then when you get on this kind of fast track inside of a big law firm and you're working, uh, lots of hours and, and you're working very hard and, and you're feeling, uh, unfulfilled often because it can be very impersonal working in an office and, and having your work criticized, you often find yourself asking, well, what's the point? And, and you're often surrounded also by negativity. It's a swamp, but the more competitive the firms, the more, the more there's the many times, the more negativity there is. And many people are, are interested in, uh, giving up when they start or, or for 
after they started firms. And it can even be that with law, small law firms. A lot of people started small to mid-sized firms and get a very bad taste in their mouth. Other people, I review resumes all day and people that have spent a year or two at a law firm and, and they still write down that they're a law clerk, meaning they haven't passed the bar yet. And so there's all sorts of problems that you could have and you could get a job with the wrong firm when you start and you could, you could lose a job and get fired and blame it on the profession and everybody gets fired in every profession. You could all sorts of negative things can happen. You could not go to a good law school. You could and, and not get a good reception in the legal market. But none of this stuff, honestly, at the beginning of your career matters. And it doesn't even matter towards the end of your career. Because I know attorneys that are in their 80s and 90s and practicing and billing $1,000 plus an hour and, uh, and having good careers still. And, and this is a long-term race. But the idea is should you quit practicing law? And all I would say at the outset is if you're in your first couple of years of this and you think you don't like it, it takes several years before you really get in the groove of things. I would say to learn to do most transactional areas of law, it takes probably about three to five years at least and to do litigation, probably two to four years uh, before you even know it. And the other thing to think about too, is a lot of people uh, are focused. And when I see most of the people I see leave the practice of law, a lot of times are from the largest firms. And you have to remember that the world isn't made up of large firms. If you, if you care about other people's problems, and this is what a lawyer has to care about almost naturally. And this is one of the reasons that it's important, excuse me, to, to, to practice law in a, if you like it. One of the reasons to work in a, in a firm is that you have to be interested in people's problems and solving them. And, and the last thing you should be doing, if you have an interest in that and other and solving other people's issues very interest you and in talking about their issues and coming up with solutions. And you're probably very suited to this. And, and if you think about how can you solve people's problems and take an interest in them, then that, that's the real sign of someone that should be doing this. And many times when people are unhappy practicing law, the reason they're unhappy is because they're just in the wrong environment. If you're in the wrong environment, then you're just not practicing in the right place. You may be a big firm may not be for you or a small firm may not be for you or a firm where you don't have a lot of guidance may not be for you. And a firm where there's, you're not around people that you like may not be for you. It's just that you have to understand that everything is about the environment and the type of people that you're working with. And that many times determines your happiness or lack of happiness. And but saying you don't want to work practicing law because you don't like working in a large firm is just like saying you don't want a friend because your best friend was mean to you, or you never want to, you, you never want to um, play basketball again because you didn't make a professional team or something. It just doesn't make any sense. But this is what many people do. Many good attorneys have a bad experience and then they quit. And I, I know that people listening to this are probably thinking about quitting because they're having bad experiences or they're unhappy where they're at. And many times you're just unhappy because this is your first employer or, or you're in the wrong employer. And and you need to do something different in a different practice setting with different types of people. Attorneys, I meet academics all the time, which are like law professors. None of those be good in a law firm. Very few of them. They're just not suited for it. And that's not, they're suited for academia. And it's the same thing with practicing law. That's not, you may not be in the best setting for you. And maybe you practice law in a smaller firm or a large firm. It's not, it's just, you have to be um, in the right practice setting. And. The reason so many people, I think, get turned off by major law firms is because they're really kind of industrial organizations. They're big, they, their job is to produce a lot of billable hours and to charge uh, clients a lot of money for the best legal services. And, and they're a relative of the new breed. Lawyers have been around forever. You know, you read old Greek poetry and they, they talk about lawyers. So there, they've always been there, but it's just a different type of profession. And most people that want to go to law school, they, they have reasons. Maybe they want to make a lot of money, but many times they have other interest in being a lawyer. They want the, they want a career that's fulfilling, or they want the different sorts of things. I mean, you need to make sure that you're, when you're looking at firms, you, you, you have to, and where you're working, that it's not about the fact that you're in an organization that's un unpleasant. It's an it's that you're in an organization that, that f fulfills you, makes you feel good. And some, you have plaintiff's attorneys and you have defense attorneys and you have large firms and small firms and you have attorneys that go out and pitch business and attorneys that do different sorts of things. And, and what, it, what upsets me, I think most of all is that most of the time, the most highly qualified attorneys are the ones that end up leaving the practice of law. They're the ones that, that have the worst experiences because they get into these industrial law firms that are more cold and impersonal many times. And, uh, and I, in my experience, the people that are most likely to leave the practice of law and give up are the people 
that started with the largest law firms. You know, they went to the best law schools. They're often the, the least likely to stick with it. People with lesser qualifications and that took longer to get going often uh, do much better. Smaller firms are more likely uh, to be practicing many times than people longer out of law school and the people who went to better law schools or, you know, or went to better firms. You may ask yourself, why is there's discrepancy? And, and I think that the reason is, is that, that there's good reasons and there's bad reasons. And most of the time, I think the reasons are, are the wrong ones. And, and I certainly could talk all day about ego and different sorts of things that hurt people. But for the most part, the only reason you should quit practicing law is if you're unfit for it. And, and, uh, and that's the main one, and there's other ones too, or, but w what people do is they, many times they end up in the wrong environment or they just don't continue after they've done it for a while. Here's the, to understand if you're unfit for the practice of law and being unfit for the practice of law is about a lot of things. And I'm going to cover a lot today. It's not going to take a ton of time, but I'm going to cover a lot of the reasons that you may be unfit for practicing law. And you need to understand that if you're unfit, you probably shouldn't be doing it. You should be doing something else. And like I said, you can do very well in other professions doing other things. It's not that difficult. And the smarts and motivation that you went into practice, that you put into being an attorney, many times are going to be much better. You'll be much better suited from a financial happiness and all sorts of standpoints than, than doing something that you're unfit for. And, and I would caution you and encourage you to not take this with a grain of salt, because if you're in the wrong profession, you're doing something wrong, you're never going to do well. And you'll also probably always be unhappy. You'll, you'll be forced, you'll or have substance abuse problems. You'll um, be angry. There's just so many things that go along with being in the wrong profession. And that's not what I want for you. I mean, I want you to be uh, doing something that uh, makes you happy and you're good at. If you're not fit for practicing law, you just shouldn't be doing it. And, and here's some ways to really decide if you're, if you're good at this and, and to, if you're if you should be practicing law, you have to be excited by helping other people solve problems. It just has to come naturally for you. You have to be someone that listens to a problem and, and just gets excited about solving it and thinks about the person and, and all of your energy and focus, uh, goes into that. And when they're talking, you're interested in them. And, and that's really one of the big things. And if you're not that way. Uh, then you probably you know, shouldn't be doing it. Think about a doctor that listens to your what's wrong and is checking their phone and text messages while you're talking and couldn't care less. That's a bad doctor. That's the same thing with attorneys. If you don't get excited about people's problems and you're an attorney because it's about your ego or something, or I don't know, then you're probably doing the wrong thing and it's not good. It's not good for the client. It's not good for you. You have to be excited about what you do. If you wanted to be like a professional baseball player and playing baseball is something that you're not interested in, that's not a good use of your skills. It's the same thing with practicing law. You have to get excited um, about solving people's problems. And uh, you really need to think about this because if you're not excited, that's bad. And you should be thinking about people's problems when you're not working. You should be thinking about them. It should consume you. It should be very interesting to you. You should want to talk to it. You should want to read about it. And, and these are the kind of attorneys that uh, do well. The best attorneys are always interested in other people's problems. The higher you go, the better the attorney, the longer, the more partners, whether they're a partner, the more big firms, they, they'll keep these giant books of all their, the work that they've done. And they'll keep files about things that they're interested in. They'll, this is what the best attorneys do. And, and if you're not that way, and you just think it's, you're just doing something rote, then that's probably not good. You need to be excited about this. And if you don't have that, you're probably not, you're, you may be in the wrong practice area, that's possible, but in general, you need to be excited about other people's problems. And that's the same thing you would want if you're an attorney. When you're doing something, time seems needs to fly. You need to get in the zone. It shouldn't be something that's boring to you and, and, and that, and you just can't stand doing that. You have to be interested in it. And, and, and that's the other thing, whatever, whatever you're doing, whether it's research or discovery, even that the work's tedious, there, there's gotta be something that appeals to you about doing that. And if it doesn't. That's a problem. And, and you need to think about, are you interested in advancing people's interests? And these, this is something that I can pick up on very quickly. When I talk to attorneys, I, the best attorneys and the best people really in any profession are very interested in, in other people's I issues for the most part, if that's what part of their job and, and you have to do that. The other thing is you, when you hear someone say, I was talking to a woman not too long ago, and she was, I was talking to her about going back 
just saying, I really don't want to do it, but I would do it if I could get paid this amount of money. And I thought, well, that's not really someone that should be doing this if they're only doing it for money. It has to feel natural to you. It means, it, it, when I say natural, it just means that it's just something that you're comfortable with. You're not, okay, after you've been doing it for a few years, it just has to feel like something you would do for less money. The, the best attorneys I've known of partners and big law firms that went and just opened solo practices, even though, or became judges and did other things, because it's just the natural, it's what they want to do. It's where their identity is. It's where they get fun. And, and then the, the best attorneys will also constantly wish they could make their results better. Certainly many people will get into a groove and, and not work as hard, but for the most part, you have to, you have to be really in, into this and you have to be really interested in it. And, and if you're not, then that's a problem because think about, again, what would you want from someone solving your problem? Would you want them not interested and detached or would you want them very interested in it? And think about that with anybody that you hire. If I hire someone to work on a car, like I, the person that's interested is much better than one that's not. And this is, these things, by the way, are what separate people that are good at something from those that are not, is the interest in it and that sort of thing. And then the other thing is a lot of the best attorneys will get emotionally involved in matters. They will, it's emotional to them. They think about people. They think about getting the best result. They get upset if they wet, lose and they cry and, or they, they get mad if they get the worst result and they go think about it for a while somewhere and if they don't get the best result and they have to be interested in it and you have to, you have to be interested enough in this stuff that you, that you, even in your free time, you would like to read and write about it and speak and, and so forth. You just have to, you have to care about it. And if you don't, then think about that. Would you want that person helping you? Cause there are things you care about, but you may care about, I know people that it's interesting. I used to be involved in like the, the college admissions com community. And, and when you look at it, when a school like, like Harvard or something, or these really good schools, like they get all these people that are, have good grades and stuff, but the people that they always try to admit for the most part and have all sorts of goals where if we, if some of them are, they want to get a certain number of athletes and people from different states, you know, and diversity. And, but, but really when they're, when they, when it comes down to choosing between two people, they're always going to choose someone that has a real passion for something as opposed to someone that doesn't. One year, I remember, you know, I was talking to someone about these people from the school that got into Harvard and one of the, two of the people were very, you know, good students, but the person that finally got in that it wasn't as quite a good a student was very interested in bugs and collected bugs and wrote about bugs and had this big bug collection and who knows. And it's just, it's things like that, just that you have to have an interest with the, the people that have an interest in something are always going to go farther than those that don't. And, and, and because you have to be interested. So if you're not interested in this stuff, that's a big deal. And if there's no interest area of law. You could see yourself interested in that's a big deal because there may be things you're interested in. You may be interested in selling cars again, or you may be interested in something else, but if you're not, that's a problem. And the attorneys that probably shouldn't be practicing law don't care about the quality of the work. They, they don't want, they make typos, they gloss over the law. They think they know everything. They, they just don't care. They, I don't know, putting on an act is the right word, but because everybody is fudging it when they start. But if you don't, if you really just are, don't really care and people annoy you when they talk about their problems and stuff, you just have very little business being an attorney. It's not a good thing for anyone. You need to be interested in it. And that's really how it works. You need to be interested also in improving when people talk to you about things that you're doing. You, you need to be interested in improving the quality of your work and, and take it seriously because it's a profession. And so you have to be interested in it. And if you're not, that's important to take into my, to, to account. Now, another thing that, that concerns me a little bit, and, uh, and this is something that I see a lot and every generation, by the way, whether it's millennials or with the people before them, or they always say, oh, the, this people are, they're different than the previous generation and so forth. But Every generation of good attorneys that it's really about to be good at it. It's about protecting other people and doing everything you can, protecting people, companies and so forth, and just making sure that, uh, the other person is helped and, and this understanding should be natural. It should be visceral and it should be something, uh, that motivates you in all respects. And, and this isn't, you shouldn't be practicing law. So if, if you're not motivated by something, then you shouldn't be practicing law. If working a weekend or 18 hours a day is necessary to help your client win, then you should do it and you should want to do it. And you need to, you need to be engaged. Now, I don't think everybody wants to work 18 hours a day, seven days a week, an exaggeration, but a, an attorney that where their a client is facing a major problem and, and they can only solve it by working lots of hours should be perfectly willing 
uh, to do that. And it shouldn't be a problem. And you just need to keep that in mind. Another thing is that the, the best attorneys, which should have no problem. If you're in order to win, you need to travel across the country and interview a witness or, or get a piece of certain piece of evidence. You need to do it and you need to want to do it. And, and you should do everything you can to, to try to make sure that happens and it, do whatever you can, because this is what people are paying you for. This is what should come naturally. And, and you may in, in your personal life, if you want to be friends with someone or you want to know someone, or you want to say something, you'll say it and, or, or do it most of the time. And it's the same thing with being an attorney. Like you have to, you have to, these, these skills are just something that are, they're part of it and you have to be driven. And it's not about you is the other thing. I think one of the big mistakes that the worst attorneys think is that they always think it's about them. And they think that it's about how much I'm getting paid. It's about how I'm treated. It's about my parking, my benefits, my this and then that. And to some extent, there's nothing wrong with it to be paid competitively and, and all this sort of thing, but it's really about protecting other people. And you have to really think about uh, that. And if you're not interested in protecting other people and companies and so forth, then and winning for them, and that doesn't come natural for you, then that's a problem. I mean, there's certain people that are wired for this and there's others that aren't, and it's okay if you're not, you're just probably in the wrong profession, um, or the wrong practice area, <laughs> you know, practice setting. So just think of what would you care about a police officer that doesn't care about defending the helpless? Someone's getting robbed and they just drive by, they're not interested or a doctor that doesn't care uh, about their patient really, and just trying to make money or a fireman that doesn't uh, care if a building burns down or an attorney that doesn't care if his client gets taken advantage of or her client gets taken advantage of, or is prosecuted improperly. These are things that you need to really think about and you need to think about them very closely. And, and these are important to you. They, they should be, they, this should be stuff that's natural. And one of the best attorneys that I ever knew was in a meeting with a client at one time I, I, that I remember, and, and the client said, why should I hire you? And, and the, the, the attorney had a, a very simple response. And this became person with one of the most famous attorneys in the country. He said, is it he hire me? Well, I will eat, drink, sleep this case and do it. And so will everyone working for me. Every case I take is the most important thing in the world to me. And it's true. And. Who would you want represented you? Would you want some guy who looks good in a suit and talks about how he went to a great law school and was, did this or would, was, did a clerkship or something and is sending to you and works on his terms? Or would you want someone who um, devotes himself to the case and thinks it's the most important thing in the world? So this is what good attorneys do. And this is a skill that separates people from average. And it's something that you should have. And if you don't, that's a problem. You, it's a real problem. And, and, and think about it. It's just not. It's not a good use of your skills. It's not a good use of the other person's skills. And there's plenty of, if all you care about is yourself, then there's plenty of, and that's the majority of the world. I'm not saying that it's a bad thing. Most people are more concerned with themselves and doing stuff for others. And then there's other professions you can do. You can do other professions and it's, it's hard to say, but, and so people who should be practicing law also uh, take the work product extremely seriously. They work like every day is their most important day. They, they, I've seen, I once, uh, saw an attorney kick a trash can across the room and they found a typo in a document. I've seen attorneys spend uh, two days in bed when their client loses an important case. And I've seen attorneys do everything they possibly can with appeals and more if somebody, um, loses a case. And it's just, there are people should be practicing law that have a spirit within them that makes them a fit for doing it. And there's others that aren't. And, and can, the best attorneys, the ones who it's very natural for often will never retire. If they love it that much, they can always want to do it. It's not retirement. It's just not an option and helping people is and advancing their client's interests is just who they are and, and, and they're committed to it. And just think about yourself. Now I'm not saying you have to be, it has to be all consuming for you, but you have to be the type of attorney that you would want representing you if you had a serious problem and just think about the things that you say or the way you think, and is that how you would want your attorney to think if you had a problem, because I bet if you had a problem, you, and if you shouldn't be practicing law, you would find someone that's much more serious in terms of that. The spirit that makes good attorneys too, by the way, really can't be measured by good SAT score or LSAT scores by your law school grades, by the quality of the law school you went to, or even where you work. None of the stuff matters. The most important thing is always going to be the, the quality of your, your drive. There's personal injury attorneys with their own jets. And there's attorneys that barely graduated from law school that are on television all the time. And you know, there's and law schools are factories to some extent. They're very profitable, by the way, they, 
if you think about it, and all you need to do, you can hire a lot of adjunct faculty to teach stuff. You can fill giant lecture halls, teaching your introductory classes and charge 50,000 or 70,000 or 100,000 a year for people to go there. And it's, they're very profitable, but they often, they're not, they're producing standardized goods and they're not necessarily um, teaching you the importance of helping people and making people, helping people do well. And the thing is that test scores and, and things that when you take a test, when you take a test, all that. It's just, it's how you're comparing to your peers. And there needs to be some way to compare yourself to your peers and, and how much you're learning and so forth and how well you're regurgitating things. And, and the law firms need to obviously want to hire the best people that, so they can tell their clients that they hire the best people and wines are ranked and attorneys are ranked and all sorts of cars are ranked and the better cars were purchased by, I don't know, better wines, by the better restaurants and so forth. And the, the point is that the, the most, the high, the highest paying clients and the, will use the best firms that have the highest qualified of attorneys that all these ranking things will determine how smart you are, but they won't determine how far you will go to solve problems and, 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 and they won't determine how much you want to win and how, how much spirit you have. And that's really, and then how fit you are for practicing law. And, and I see attorneys all the time. They don't care about what they're doing. And it's very obvious that they're in the wrong place or if they're, nothing's going to happen with them. And, and, and those people uh, typically are much more likely to talk about their problems and how serious they are, be interested in their clients. So if you care about the work you do, then, you know, you really sh shouldn't ever quit practicing law. If you'd like this and you think about other people, or you can see yourself caring more about other people and you get involved in other people's problems and you take a lot of pride in getting good results, then, then, you know, it's probably uh, a good idea, you know, for you to stick with it. I, I can't tell you when to leave, but I, I can tell you that if you have those qualities, then you're probably going to, you're probably the kind of person that that should stick with the practice of law. And very few people do believe for when they have those qualities, then you should really try to stick with it if you have those qualities. And if you don't, then, then just think, would you want to be represented by you and you don't care, then that's an issue. One final thing I would say is just, if you're thinking about leaving the practice of law and you believe that, that for whatever reason, you, you shouldn't be influenced by necessarily by the people around you. So a lot of people are very susceptible to the opinions of their peers, by the opinions of other people by believing that issues that they're having are related to practicing law, but you really need to think through that. I would say fairly or carefully, because if you may be having issues that are unrelated to practicing law, they, and you may be being influenced by others when you are maybe in the right profession to begin with, and you can just be in the wrong atmosphere. And there, there's bad firms and there's bad places and there's places where the attorneys aren't nice, where the, the culture's bad and where. Uh, people don't care about can't, you know, their, their, their clients and you may be picking up on that. And, and that means you just need to be in another app, in another place. How can you tell when it's time to go and, and leave uh, a law firm? Well, or the practice of law. The big thing is, I'll just tell you a quick story. The other day I received a, a call from a, someone who'd started their career at a top law firm. And one year into his practice, he quit being an attorney and started some small company that also failed. And then a year later, the attorney was interested in relocating out of a high pressure system, city and finding a job or a mellow city. And cause he'd run out of money and he wanted to have weekends, but he wanted to be able to leave at five or six. And, and there's nothing wrong, um, with, with these sorts of calls or wanting these things because people have, they have lives outside of work. They have families, they have hobbies. They, there's nothing saying that you have to be in a high pressure uh, position that I'm not criticizing that at all. And he said, I, he just wanted a normal law firm job. And, but then I said to him, I said, you don't want to have to work weekends. If one of your clients is selling the company and the work needs to get done before Monday. And he said, no, there's no way I would do that. And I said, you don't want to have to meet potential clients for dinner uh, a few times a week to make sure you always have work to do. And he said, no, I would rather spend that time with my family. I'm not going to work. And I'm not interested in dealing with other people's problems after, you know, normal business hours. So that particular attorney is an example of someone that probably shouldn't be practicing law, at least not in the law firm, because he didn't have any interest in the work or helping his clients or really being an attorney. His priorities, he'd already left the practice of law. And so his priorities were really about him. And, and, and about his weekends. Now that doesn't mean he shouldn't, he couldn't practice law in a government office and all sorts of, or maybe in house or different types of things, but you, he's not really a, a good fit for a law firm and, and anything should be working with other people that needs to take charge of the problems. And, and that's just in it. You can very easily many times spot attorneys that aren't fit practicing law because they just talk about themselves and, and there's nothing wrong with that. And I certainly 
talk about myself. And But the concept of being an advocate means you have to be interested in advancing other people's interests. And that's what an attorney is all about. It has to just come naturally to you. You have to, there's certain things that come naturally. Certain people are naturally drawn to different types of people on the dating scene or they're, or they're naturally drawn to different types of books when they read and things. And you have to be naturally drawn to being interested in, in advancing other people's interest. And, and when, whenever I talk to people and I, an attorney and I hear them talk about their work, their clients and what they love about their job, but the more I know that they're fit for practicing law and, and you can tell by resumes and by resumes will typically they'll be very well thought out and they'll list all these different things that they're doing and working on. And that's very attractive. And those are things that make a uh, good attorneys. It's just like that for every profession y you want to represent you that cares about you and where you're coming from and understands um, what's important to you. And those, those are just, those are all big deals. And those are important things. If you care about other people's problems and you just shouldn't quit, and that's the thing. You should never really ever quit if that excites and motivates you because there's a, most people are not like that. The, the net, the, most of society isn't that concerned about other people's problems and it's just not natural and it's not um, to most people. It's not something you even can teach you. You either have it or you don't. And uh, some people are natural athletes and some people are, you know, naturally good at math. I couldn't believe it. When I was, when my daughter was in, was five years old, there was a, another five-year-old that put then our neighborhood that was already doing algebra. What the hell? This is a Kumon, very naturally gifted at math. I, I don't know. Just it's something. So this is, if you have this, then it's a natural gift and, and you shouldn't quit practicing law. That's really it. You shouldn't. And the world needs you and they need people like you. And, and you can do that, care about other people in other professions too. But if you have that natural gift, then you're really a fit for practicing law. The big thing though, is if you are a fit, you need to find the right man. So uh, I remember when I was in law school, I was dating a girl uh, from a small town in Pennsylvania outside of Harrisburg. And I became close with her family and they arranged for me to interview with a small law firm in the town. And in the law office, it was fun. It was in a, it was in a hall that was several hundred years old and there was a bunch of antiques and stuff. And then it's an interesting little office and it was nice. And, and I met one attorney, he said he had to leave at four to go coach his daughter's soccer practice. And another attorney had just returned from like a two week trip to Costa Rica. And uh, a lot of the attorneys had golf paraphernalia and so forth in their offices. And another told me that they liked to play at lunch and, and they all had big offices, but bedrooms. So they had, they were just, it was nice. They had fireplaces because that's how people kept warm in you know, the past and uh, talked about their country club and so forth. And then after in my final interview, it was on by 5.30, I, you know, I, I saw these, you know, those luxury cars are uh, leaving in the parking lot and, and a lot of them actually hadn't hired anybody in years. And most of the people had been there their entire careers. And, and a lot of the attorneys spoke, you know, how they were involved in the chamber of commerce and doing this and that, and, uh, and they were very happy. They weren't uptight. They seemed like they were doing well financially. They seemed very well adjusted. They had, they were all married and seemed that they were representing local businesses and local people and, and they had lives outside of the office and, and, and it just seemed like a pretty good arrangement that these guys had. And they were all men by the way, but so well, but, but they just weren't that concerned about needing associates to work crazy hours or spending a lot of money in offices or, and that thing, they were just a stable, normal law firm. And this sort of law firm, by the way, has existed probably for, you know, a, a long time. This is how law firms have always have been in the country. And when lawyers were lawyers and didn't work in these kind of giant firms. And although I never knew it at the time, and this was actually an incredible opportunity that I would have had to, to have been happy as an attorney practicing law. And, and in this town, there were actually, you know, Amish people and that too close by, but of course, general carriages I was actually was quite in that next town over and, but, and it was, I was being offered a gift of oh, what an attorney could be. It was a respected profession where you were doing important things, where you worked with peers and you were happy and so forth. And I would never see anything like this again. And it wasn't the type of law firm that I would ever imagine myself working in. And certainly you never would have accepted because I believed I had to work in a big firm and these attorneys, they all went to local law schools that I never heard of. And I knew they would never be able to offer me the type of salary I wanted. And, and, and I thought I was better than all this. This could have been the perfect job. And if I taken a job there, I have no doubt uh, that the odds that I would have continued practicing law would be pretty good. And in the, in your case, uh, you'll probably at some point a counter, if you're suited to practicing law, at some point, someone will send you a job or you'll interview for a job or you'll get a job and turn it down. That would be the perfect job for you. 
I see attorneys do this all the time I, and it's frustrating and it's upsetting. The attorneys find jobs with the government, small companies and other places, and then, and then the other places where they could be happy. And then they take jobs and wind up unhappy instead. And it's a lot of cases because their mind, they, they believe that they need to find the largest, most prestigious firms. And even if it's not better for them and, and I've helped countless attorneys find positions like this. And, and that's just, it's kind of been my experience that most of the time, those attorneys will either turn the jobs down or those same attorneys will take a job with a more prestigious firm instead. And, and I see this a lot as frequently sometimes as several times a month. And, and in many times attorneys will pick up and move. So they may move to New York, from New York city to a smaller market with a spouse or something, and, and they'll get them a great job in that area with nice people and so forth, steady work. And, and, and the job will pay one third or whatever of what they were making or half or something. And, and this will be in an area where you could literally buy a house for a fraction of what, what it would be in a big city. And, um, and I'll say to them when they don't take the job, I said, why, why wouldn't you take the job? And they'll say, it's too much of a step down. And, and the idea is, and I never have understood this logic because when you find a job many times in a smaller market and your expenses are different, uh, you may be working with the people you can work with for your entire career. And just because you don't want to work with some of the most aggressive and high paying attorneys on earth, or it doesn't mean you have to quit the practice of law. But this is what people do. They, they often consider uh, working anything with the largest firms to be a step down. And, and they don't realize that if you leave a good law firm and, and, and you don't take a job, even a smaller firm that people will believe that you don't want to practice law anymore. And then it'll be even harder to get um, a job. So uh, I knew a New York attorney once that I uh, spent years uh, trying to get a job doing white collar litigation. And, uh, and I finally found him a job in New York in the suburbs of New York that paid about a hundred thousand dollars a year. And then one of his friends actually got a job in uh, doing general litigation, in a New York law firm that was more prestigious than his firm for 170,000. And this was a while ago, so it would have been even more now. And he took his friend's job and I said, why did you turn down you know, this job? And he said, well, how can I turn down a firm with that name? And now that didn't work out. He was very unhappy. He got his dream job, but he decided to follow the prestige route. And now he's been working as a document review attorney for years. He's just never, he had such a bad experience. He hated billing 2,500 hours a year and commuting and sleep. And, and so I just wonder what would have happened to him if he'd gone to the small firm. And I think he probably would have been much happier in still working today. But young attorneys are always faced with the added pressure of having the idea of what is important, that it's important to be, you know, practicing a large law firm and they. They have that drill into them constantly, but they're, they're really concerned about how they look to others, I think. And that's what I'm concerned about with you. And if you're thinking about leaving is that you may, even though the ideal environment exists for you somewhere and you may be suited to practicing law, you may actually leave for the wrong reasons. So a lot of people think that it's better to leave than practice of law because it'll look better than instead of practicing a lesser firm where their peers will think wow leave them and, and, and there's, you'll always get a lot of support for that idea because the, the attorneys don't want competition. Anybody that's left wants that support. Others think that, that if they work anywhere that without the, that it's been a law firm, that it's going to have the same demands as large institutional law firms. And that's not necessarily uh, the case. Almost every law firm in the country is not a large institutional law firm. The majority, if you take all the large institutional law firms, it's uh, where people work, it's a, it's a very small percentage of the number of attorneys working in the different practice settings. And the other thing is law firms often require massive hours from their associates, partners, and others. And that's just, it's difficult. And, and it's not something that is necessarily always natural. It's what makes money. And, and, and law firms, large law firms have to make a lot of money because it helps them recruit associates. And, and it's always a, a function of how the law firm can do. And, and, and so there's just a lot to it. And then and there's a lot of disconnect, I think, in the larger law firms. I think many times, uh, and I love large law firms, I not, have nothing wrong with them, but I think that a, a disconnect many times where people believe that work is being done for work's sake and not because it's what always client needs. And, and that's not necessarily the truth. The, the work's being done because the, the large law firms are thorough, but at the same time, sometimes it's unnecessary work that is actually necessary. The idea is what is it needed to help the client versus what is needed to help the law firm? This can be one of the reasons to leave. If the client, a good attorneys often believe that their client's interests are being harmed or some are motivated to help others and, and they can do it in a different environment. So let me just see a couple of final points here. Environment. Yeah. And so the final thing is, I, I think is that whatever the environment you work in, if you're suited to practicing law, you need to be 
uh, with people that are going to make you feel supported and comfortable and, and, and in a competitive environment make you feel supported and comfortable, but you need to be around people uh, that match kind of your way of looking at the world and, and what you think. And, and just because you're working with people you don't like. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean you're in the wrong profession. There are a lot of firms that are just bad fits for individual people. It may be, you may be more suited being a solo practitioner with a small firm or with a larger firm. And if you're in a, a wrong fit, it's just, it's just the environment. And that's really what you're facing. And, and you need to remember that that's not a reason to leave the practice of law. Working in another environment could drastically change how you feel about the profession. And you should definitely not quit. If you're in a position where, where you're going to um, be happy, where you're, you enjoy helping people. And the final thing I'd say is just, and these are some conclusions, and then I will take questions is that the, the years of hard work it takes for attorneys to end up in a major law firm, all it's really doing is it's giving you a ticket. It's not it, to get in, to get a job, it gives you a ticket to work harder and to be part of a team. And, and, and it's no different if you work hard to get into the Olympics and think you made it just because you're in the Olympics, you actually have to trade harder at the Olympics because now you're competing with you know, people that are even more competitive and, and you have to step up and work very hard. So I, the reason I say this, because you may be 10 or 20 years or more out thinking about practicing law, but the majority of people that leave uh, very early, because I think that they want to be in a position where they feel like they don't have to work as hard and so forth right away. And that's not always where they don't want the pressure and they want to take their foot off the gas. And actually when you start work and for the first several years, that's when you have to put your foot the most on the gas. When you start, the better you work, the harder you work in law school, the better law firm you can get into. And then you'll actually have to work even harder there. And that may not be what you want. And it's okay. If you don't want to work in a big firm and don't want the pressure, you may just like the, the work and you can work in all sorts of places. And, and like I said earlier, I know several uh, attorneys in their eighties that like tennis and play every day and are people in the, and they would regardless of, I'm sorry, I know people in their eighties that play tennis every day and would, uh, regardless of how good they were at it, they just love it. And, and it's just something that they do and, and, but other people don't. And, and it's just because you like tennis and you play every day, doesn't mean you would want to play 14 hours a day. And so it's just think about that as a practice of law, you shouldn't have to work crazy hours and, and that sort of thing, if you don't like it. So if you like attorney, if you like being an attorney or just because you don't like doing it on a industrial scale, doesn't mean you should quit or just because you're unhappy in your current firm, doesn't mean you should quit. But the big thing is just tonight, there's a, I could talk to you about reasons to quit practice of law forever, but the big thing is just think about if you're motivated by helping other people, then you probably should leave. But if you are motivated by helping other people, then you should stay and and then just make sure you're doing so in an environment that works for you. So I'll take a quick break and, and then I'll come back. And when I come back, I'll answer uh, as many questions as anybody has. So you can ask questions about this presentation, or you can ask questions uh, about anything related to your career. All the questions, of course, are anonymous. I'm happy to answer them. And honestly, this is the favorite part of my week is answering questions. Cause I, you can, no question is really off limits when it comes to your career. Cause I know. Uh, a lot of people are suffering silently and, and I'll do what I can to help. I'm just going to grab some coffee, then I'll be back in two minutes. Thanks. Do you have questions? So give me one second here. Um, I'm just going to pull up here. I'm just opening a, a word document so I can show everyone with the questions. All right. So let's get here to the questions. Uh, let's start my video. Ooh, look at that. That's weird. Uh, give me one second here. Well, I don't Let's strange. Oh, here we go. Okay. Questions. Okay. Oh, this is a good question. I like this. Thank you for whoever answered this one. I don't know what, oh, what happened to my, give me one second. Sorry. Um, find it to work done. Okay. So this per first question is, okay. Good. Your story about the Bucolic small law firm where, let's see. Where everyone once you have to really resonate with me. I ended up a firm like this over the summer in a smaller market. I also came from a top law school, though I ultimately accepted an offer from, a small, from the smaller firm after striking out OCI. I received an offer and had a great experience. I could tell this is the type of firm where I could have a future. However, I still harbor the goal setting in a major firm in the market, and it's something I can't shake. The idea of moving up to a bigger firm is still something I want to pursue. My question is, would it be a mistake for me to pursue a larger firm that if I've always that I've already found it was a good fit and working a large law, small law firm, the my options in the future. 
Okay. That's a good question. So there's really a couple different ways to look at that. The first thing is I'm assuming, and I don't know, but I'm assuming you're a litigator, but I don't know. If it's a small law firm, it's probably going to be litigation because most small law firms are litigation, but it doesn't really matter. You have to, one of the things to ask is when you're looking at law firms, ask what happened to the people that come, what happened to the people that came before? And, and then the other one is, uh, will I be a big fish in a small pond, a uh, fish in a small pond? Uh, or a small fish in a big pond. So I think there's a couple of different ways to think about this question. And, but the first thing I would say in terms of the people that came before me, that's a question that I really wish I would have answered when I, before I went to work at some big law firm, one, one particular big law firm that I worked at, because those can be good, good stuff, or they can be bad. And, and then you have to get a sense of what happens to the majority of the people. Now, and they, you're, at the people that came before you with the smaller law firm, are now partners and they hire very few people and you feel like it's a good fit, that should tell you something that you have a future there. And if, if the bad things happen to them, like you don't, there's no questions or they left or they, you don't know, then that's not good. So you have to ask that for every employer that you think about working at. And the next thing is when you go to work in a large law firm, you should also think about the answers to those questions. And that the problem with the large law firms are that a lot of people that uh, go to work in large law firms bad things happen to them, especially in some of the largest cities. Now that's not, doesn't happen to all of them, of course, but, but a lot of bad things happen because people get a very bad taste in their mouth and you're practicing in an industrial law firm and that's not for everyone. And I don't have any criticisms of it because it actually is what companies require and there's nothing wrong with this and this law firms have adapted to that, but does do good things or bad things happen? Do, do the attorneys you're working with at the smaller law firm look happy or do they not? And there's a lot of talk, like one. One of the, the purposes of all religions is, and again, I'm not going to, I'm not doing a religious talk here, but religion, most yoga, uh, exercise, therapy, therapy, what else? All this stuff. A lot of it, the, I wouldn't say exercise so much, but it does do it while you're doing meditation is the elimination of the ego. So everyone's trying to eliminate their ego and, and the ego is, is the big problem. And I'm not, I'm not. Doing, I'm not trying to talk to you about psychology or religion or anything, but this is what all these things are doing. They're all trying to eliminate ego. I know self-improvement is actually many times blowing up ego and different types of religions may try to blow up your ego. For example, I kind of talk about these religions, but some religions are all about you or you think about you instead of you other most, but most religions are about connecting with something outside yourself and eliminating your ego because the ego, when you're focused on yourself can hurt you. So. The problem with when you make career decisions based on is you wind up in bad places. And that's the point of the talk today was the people that made decisions based on ego ended up unhappy. And when you make decisions based on how things appear to other people, based on how they appear to yourself, that can actually harm you a lot in the long run. And, and, and that's not necessarily the right thing for you. Now, if you want to, if you work in a larger law firm there, you are going to have opportunities that you won't have in a smaller law firm. Those opportunities will include things like going in house in a larger company. They'll include things like becoming a partner in a big law firm. They'll include access to larger clients and work on more sophisticated matters. They will include the ability to get deeper in different things and learn different legal skills than you might learn in a smaller firm. They'll include the ability to learn from a greater variety of people. They'll include the ability to work on matters that are in, in the, in, in the national news. So they'll include learning, having the ability to move to other larger law firms. If you work in a smaller law firm, you can still do all that, but you can still move to a larger law firm and you can still develop certain types of clients. But the big thing to understand the largest clients and the most sophisticated clients with the most sophisticated work always use the largest firms and most sophisticated client, unless it's something like patent prosecution or, but so most sophisticated clients use the largest firms. So like, for example, I'm from Detroit and, and, and I don't live in Detroit now, but I'm from there and if general motors or one of these big companies has a huge problem. They're going to hire a big law firm in New York or uh, Los Angeles, even though the firms in Detroit, there's some just really awesome ones, but for their biggest problems, they're probably not going to hire or to bet the company litigation or their public going public and banks are going to hire the largest firms in the largest. Now, is that something you want to be part of? I don't know. It may not be. I personally believe that your option, your goal should be to be happy. And, um, and if you go someplace that is the largest firms, there's very few opportunities. 
there are very few opportunities for advancement and, and that may not be something good for you. And so I, I, I just, there's just, they're, they're partner heavy, they're, uh, there's all sorts of things that can hold you back. If, the, if you go to a smaller firm, you probably learn how to develop clients, you'll probably get a book of clients, you'll feel, you'll feel independent and, and you feel secure much sooner if you throw yourself into it. And you will also be rewarded for probably for throwing yourself into everything with a smaller firm. So I can't tell you what to do. I can tell you that if you go to a smaller firm and the smaller firm, the odds are pretty good that you'll be practicing law several years from now and, and, and probably more happy and well-adjusted. And if you don't, the odds are pretty good that you, if you try to go to a larger firm that you won't. If you want to be in a larger law firm, I think you can get into one fairly easily. You could probably do on-campus interviewing this year, and then you could also work at a clerkship, a federal district court clerkship or something, and get a job at a big firm after that. And there's all sorts of things you can do. But frankly, if you find a group of people that you really like and you like them and you feel like you're going to get really good training, then you're probably better off. And the stuff you can't shake that you're talking about is really just your ego. That's your ego saying, I need to do this. I need to be the most competitive. And really what you need to think about is, can you be happy? That's, that's, you know, what I would say. And I can't answer that. And you may, if you do want to be in a large firm, you just need to be ready for it. Know what to expect. You need to read everything that I'm writing and or, or written and, and study and, and that sort of, thing. And that's what I would recommend. And I hope that helps. I know that's a long way to answer it, but it's definitely not an easy decision. Okay. I've been practicing criminal defense for 15 years and for murder cases, molestation cases, I'm feeling burned out. What areas of law have you seen criminal lawyers transition into? There's lots of areas of law that you can transition into. I, I was actually looking at some criminal attorneys sporting and I can see how you would be burned out doing that. You have a couple different options. You could, you could certainly transition to the government. So that would be one, but the other one would be that you could transition. Typically you could transition to litigation. There's some practice areas that aren't too, and different types of litigation uh, you can do. So you can learn different types of litigation. There's some practice areas that people pick up fairly quickly. Like you can pick up immigration law. You can pick up different types of practice areas. You may, you may want to transition into a white collar litigation. I don't know, but those are some things that I would recommend. The other option too is as a criminal attorney, if you've done this, you always can probably teach in law school and do things like that. And then, and then if in criminal defense law is, a, is its own kind of laws, it's not the same type of litigation as commercial litigation. You certainly can do a different types of insurance work and things, or you may just want to work in a different type of practice setting but doing criminal law. So it's a good question. What I would do is I would, you always want to look at, you want to look at what other people have done and look up all the criminal attorneys you've seen and see that have, have left. And it's very, it's very common for people to do other things. Okay. Well, this is a fun question. I love this. So my wife is a real estate agent. How can I use my JD MBA to help a sister? Or what else can I be thinking about doing outside of the law firm? I think you could actually become a real estate agent. I think real estate agents that are attorneys do very well. Most of them are much happier than they were practicing law. And they're often, I mean, they just have, they're very thorough. They, they think through things. You certainly could be a real estate agent yourself. I, there's nothing wrong with it. I, real estate agents can do exceptionally well, especially in a market like this, but you're JD, you have a JD and MBA. So I don't, I that that's great. Now, all that shows me is you have a lot of motivation and many times applying that motivation to other things is going to you get better results than you would practice in law. It's amazing. So many attorneys, by the way, go to get into, you know, the legal field and just don't like it or, or they, they don't get a lot of very warm reception. <laughs> One of my neighbors went to a, um, like a fourth tier law school. That's no longer in business. I guess the, you call it a business and, uh, and, and he started this giant company that I think he sold for a couple hundred million dollars. And it's just, you, there's so many opportunities for people that are attorneys with your skills. And, and, and so I don't, if you're unhappy or you're just not getting a warm reception or you feel like you're capable of more. Then, then it's that you can certainly do other things. So I recommend doing it. And most attorneys that, that aren't happy practicing law, and then they find something else or much happier doing something else. Okay. Okay. Let me see here. This is actually interesting. Wow. What a, this is a great question. Thank you, by the way, for whoever asked the question. I'm about ready to answer because it's a long question and it looks really good. Okay. This question is, let's see. I'm wondering if you could talk about going on short-term disability leave in big law. Let me just say, what is it? What are the career ramifications? A risk reward. I'm currently a first year at about 10. Overall, the work hasn't been as bad as expected. I'm even say I like it. The problem is I was assaulted. Wow. I'm sorry. 
during three out have been diagnosed with PTSD. It's made daily life a struggle. If I'm on a contentious call where I can hear an angry tone of voice, I disassociate and won't remember anything. I've lost hours of my day disassociation. My short-term working memory is shot. You get the picture. My biggest concerns are getting denied leave and then having all my personal business out there being gossiped about and getting a reputation as a slacker for trying to leave. Or even if I am able to take leave, I still have some concerns about coming back and being gossiped about ruining my reputation at the firm and then not being able to lateral with a few months gap on your resume. Any advice? Okay, I'm going to give you some advice. And so I, the first thing is I'd like to read, I listen to a lot of podcasts and things. And, and the first thing is that there's, in terms of what you're dealing with, the PTSD, there's a lot of, and again, I'm not recommend making any recommendations, but one thing I would, I don't know, it's Tim Ferriss is one of them. He has Ferriss, uh, he talks about, I don't know, mushrooms, and all these alternative therapies, you know, and Joe Rogan, which has a podcast. And this, I understand this is absolutely crazy, but therapies, I just give me one second. Yeah, that's Ferris, you have Joe Rogan, uh, talks about, you know, what does he talk about? I don't know, different alternative things. And then you have other common things, which are, which I do, which are things like Pearson, which would be like exercise, meditation and all that. So. A lot of these problems that, that you may be experiencing from what happened to you, and I don't know what kind of assault it was, and I certainly apologize, but you should investigate everything you possibly can. And I'm not going to recommend uh, anyone on this call do shrooms or, or what does he talk about? He talks about things like, I don't know, float tech, DMT, all this stuff. But I was actually having a talk with my, my daughter this weekend and, and she's 14 and she's a very good student, but she's actually a perfect student, but. At the same time, she's experiencing all these kind of problems that a lot of times girls, nerdy kids have when they turn 14 or going to high school. And what I told her is that one of the, one of the big things is the way that, you know, that I certainly try to live my life. And this is advice for every attorney out there is you need to, you need to emphasize. And then you have people like religion, prayer, I, I don't know what is prayer. Is that one? Or, uh, anyway. So you have all these things, like ways of coping, um, with things that come at you, but in all, everybody out there is trying to, to drown out, trying to drown out. Everyone is trying to draw out, draw out, draw out uh, the negative. That, so this is, and this is actually, this is very important. Every, all around us, there's all these problems and there's, and so people, everyone is trying to, everyone has, you have PTSD, everyone has issues and some people get different diseases and other people do things, but everyone has these issues with their mind, frankly, they're stressed, they're, they're unable to cope with things. They have limits that they come up against very quickly. And so everyone is trying to deal with this. And, and if you're thinking about ending the practice law, then this is also a, a good issue for you to think about because everyone's dealing with these things. And, uh, and I'm going to answer your question in a second, but, and then new prescription, there's new alternative, new therapies, which are include uh, ketamine, all, all sorts. So there's all, all sorts of, which I think you can actually get a prescription for. So it's all sorts of different therapies and, and different things you can do. And, but everyone is trying to drown out the negative that influences them. And so you have to decide how do you do that? So some people work all the time, which I know people that do that. Some people drink out a lot of alcohol too much. Some people will exercise too much exercise. Some people will throw themselves into religion. Uh, some people will become codependent on others. Some people will, you know, uh, significant per percentage of some smoke pot, do drugs, I'm trying to think of what else. Um, some people sex, what else there is just so much stuff, therapy, antidepressants, downers, uppers. So everyone's dealing with this, everyone down. And this really is the struggle. This is the struggle that everyone taught has. And then other people will just throw themselves into social stuff, uh, friends, so forth. Some people will buy things and just off, or, or other forms of distraction. So these are all, this is, and I'm not going to get too much into it, but this, everyone has uh, all this negative stuff that's influencing them. And, and so they try to, they try to do all these different things to, to get out of it. And, and it, what I would say to you is the first thing is if you have, believe you have PTSD, that's, yeah, you probably do, but in at everything you've talked about here sounds like you're. You are having, uh, you know, some issues, but these are all, all these ways that people cope. Some are positive and some are negative. 
So obviously therapy is positive. Exercise can be positive. There's different things. Some of this stuff, I would recommend listening to some of these things about different things you can do with exercise and meditation, all these things. And so I personally, myself, like in terms of how do I deal with it? How do I uh, make myself productive? And, and I do, I'm able to be very productive and work very long hours and stuff, but I do things like I do yoga in the morning. I exercise every act I have. A, I do float tank. I have a float tank. Um, I try to do something about it. I do exercise daily, meditation and vitamins, meditation. I spend uh, at least 30 minutes a day reviewing room with the day, reviewing day with my girlfriend. So pop day. I, I do all sorts of stuff. And this is just on a daily basis. And, and, oh, I do journaling. So you have to get these voices and things that, and that when I say voices, negative things that are hurting you, you have to get them out of control. You have to get them under control. And, and the only way to do that many times is to really set aside time to, 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 to put more positive things in than negative things and to have a, a process of doing that. And the people that do these things typically uh, do very well. You can't constantly do things. And now there are therapies. That, and the only reason I bring this up is because I've read a lot of stuff recently and people just keep talking about all this stuff with trying these experimental things. And a lot of it apparently does work. I'm not going to get on a, a live talk and tell someone to, to do drugs, but at the same time, a lot of this stuff is going very much mainstream. I can't, and it's something that you may, um, that, that, that a lot of these things I've read associated with cured PTSD. So that's the first thing. Now, the next thing is if you do take a leave, most big, you're concerned here, people gossiping, getting a reputation as a slacker for trying to take a leave. You don't need to say what the reason is you're taking a leave. You, I think you can just say you have a health problem. You need to take a leave and do that. The problem with taking a leave is that once you do that, then you may not want to come back. I don't think you're going to be gossiped about and ruin your reputation at the firm. But I don't know. I don't know. It depends on the firm you're working at. If it was me, I would try to approach the problem in other ways first uh, before taking the leave and and then and see if there's a way to do that. Because a lot of times these problems can be taken care of by figuring out a positive ways to do things. And so I would read therapies for PTSD, things that have been proven to, you know, PTSD. And, and, and see what you can do to attack it. And that would be my advice. If you do leave the practice of law and you, you're not necessarily going to ruin your reputation, people are entitled to have problems. But the problem is that once you do that, the, the people, some people may lose a little bit of confidence in you and stop giving you as much work. So if there's a way for you to take care of it without doing that, that's what I would do. So that's a long uh, answer. But if you have a follow up, I'm happy uh, to answer that. Okay, let's see. Okay. Do you have a resource guide of industries, careers, which are relevant to attorneys that do not involve the practice of law? So there's an, there's an article that I wrote a long time ago, of different things you can do with a law degree, but I recommend there's a lot of personality tests out there and I always, and most of them are free. So you can take a lot of personality tests and free ones. And what I recommend doing is take taking free personality tests and, and, and then, and then getting a sense of the kind of stuff that appeals to you because. I can't tell you what a good career for you is. What I can tell you is most attorneys, uh, that I know go into alternative careers and, and choose something that they like to very well. I know attorneys that are, became famous cooks. I know attorneys that have, have run, are running very successful exercise studios and run, I know one the woman that's running a Bikram yoga studio. I know people that do all these different fun things and you can too. There's not. There's nothing stopping you from doing all sorts of different things. And I certainly would recommend doing that to so take a personality test, but you have to, whatever it is that interests you, you can do, you can be a contractor, you can be, and the skills you get being an attorney can make it much better. Okay, here's a fun question. Another thing, but that's what I'd recommend. I think every, someone should always consider alternative careers if they're unhappy because there's a lot of them. Okay. I'm currently at a. Associate at one of the big labor and employment firms, Jackson Lewis, Phyllis Phillips, et cetera. Okay. I like these firms. The hours aren't crushing, but firm life is still firm life. Yeah. Those are good firms. I like both those firms. Those are great places to work, by the way, if anybody is a labor and employment attorney. Aren't that crushing, but firm life is still firm life. I'm wondering what my real estate options are for going in house and after how many years I should do it in five, seven years looks like the sweet spot. 
Yeah, any advice? I, I think at five to seven years, you can definitely go in house. So there's no, there's no really, once you have that much experience, you can definitely go in house after probably five to seven years is what it takes typically. And that would be as a labor and employment attorney. But one thing to reckon, understand too, that's just a kind of important is a lot of times, if you want to work with the largest law firms, you often want to try to become a partner first. And then after you become a partner, I'm one of the largest, larger companies, but after you become a partner, then, that, then it's much easier, uh, to move to larger firms. And one thing I'll say, I like these firms, Fisher and Phillips and Jackson Lewis. Another one I like is Littler Mendelssohn. And there's some other ones like Ford and Harrison. These are, people seem really happy at these firms for the most part. Now they're not, and just like you said, these are big companies, firms, but they're just not as crazy many times as a, a lot of big firms and, and people seem to have much better experiences. And they, they, these are labor and employment firms. Labor and employment typically doesn't pay as much as a lot of other practice areas because companies retain labor and employment attorneys for ongoing representation. And so it's not where they're getting a litigator and they're being sued and they need to pay high rates and so that sort of thing. So they, they don't pay as much. It's not because they're not good firms. It's just, they have a lot of ongoing work, but people seem a lot happier at these firms. I, I've noticed that a lot that you know, Fisher Phillips, Jackson Lewis, that people are very happy. And I. I actually hired an attorney once to work in our uh, company from Jackson Lewis, and she was excellent. And, and, and I think uh, those are good firms. But if you want to go in-house, I think you could easily get a job in-house as a labor and employment attorney. But you can also get a job many times doing HR in companies where you get to advise people if you have that type of experience. That can be very helpful. Okay, let's see. If... All right, the next question. Yeah, but I, I really like Fisher Phillips. I just like Fisher Phillips and... Jackson Lewis and the Mendelssohn and so forth. Cause I think people just seem very happy there uh, for the most part, but I'm sure there's exceptions, but you know, for the most part, okay. I clerked for two years and have been with my new whatever firm for two years. I'm not self harm or addict miserable, but I have developed anxiety and depression since joining private practice, which is normal. And the job is not even that bad comparatively. So I'm clearly not a fit for this kind of lifestyle. I'd like to try the in-house thing before leaving the profession together. Alums from my school that have spoken with generally seem happy with that. I'm assuming the answer is probably a hard no, but I'm a absolutely just the prospect of having to the work for at least three more years before I'm competitive. Any insight into the issue or other advice for this type of predicament? Okay. Well, you can go in house at any time. You are fine to go in house. I, and you can start applying to in house jobs now, especially if you're at a very good firm and we have two years of clerkship experience, you can go in house. There's nothing you know wrong with that. Now. The anxiety and depression is normal for litigators uh, many times because you have deadlines and, and you're working, and there's mistakes that can be made and your you know clients are mad, judges are mad and so forth. So it, it, most litigators have anxiety and depression and you can deal with that in a lot of different ways. Exercise is one, meditation, but they're, but it, but you're, but you're unhappy and you don't like the firm you're at. One suggestion would be a smaller firm. Most people that go to work in smaller firms as litigators are in smaller markets end up being much happier. But if you want to go in house, you can go in house right away. There's nothing stopping you from going in house. Like you can start going in house at any level and, and typically just apply to uh, a lot of different places. But you may not want to work in the largest company. You may want to work in a smaller, but it, it doesn't really matter. I've hired, I have an in-house um, litigator right now that I think had a couple of years of experience, but she was hired. You can do it right away. There's nothing, you know, stopping you. Now, the only reason to stay around longer would be if you want to get in, if you feel like that's going to help you. Typically it's going to be easier working in smaller markets or with, with startups or entrepreneurs and things, but I, I don't think you, you really, uh, have much of, uh, much to worry about. One thing I would say is you're just talking about how you have spoken to some alums and so forth, and they're happy with the choice. So that's a good way to get in-house jobs is to kind of network that way as well is to talk to different alums from your, and other people that you know that are in a house and, and ask and just put your, keep your ear to the ground and you'll find something, but, and apply to a lot of places. And that would be one of the things that I'd recommend. Okay. This is actually interesting. Now we've got a question that's very similar to what you were asking. Okay. Would great advice. I went in house fairly or third or fourth years from a large law firm where I ran large deals, partner oversight, but that oversight was fairly minimal to a place where almost everything I looked at before it goes out. Aside from this, I like the job, my team in the hours, but I'm wondering how this might impact for this lawyer. I can't help but review things a bit carefully since I now review things a bit less carefully. I see. Okay. How dangerous is this from a long-term growth perspective? How, am I ever thinking this? Is there anything I can do to mitigate the issue? And I know it's not an issue about work product or competency specifically. And so this is the case across our department. I think it's actually fine. I think that the more closely people are reviewing your work, 
it gives you a message shows that, that, that they're doing very good work there. And a lot of times, I don't know how big the company you're in, uh, but you can see here, this person, a lot of times, if you work at a big firm like Sullivan and Cromwell is a perfect example, like people that get so much freaking early experience there that when they go to other firms, they feel like they're, they're being micromanaged. I don't think any of this is dangerous from a long-term growth perspective. I think that you need to be even more careful to impress people about the quality of work you're doing. But the only other thing I would say is you do, because of the quality, the, the way the market is right now, you really, I don't know how long you've been in-house, but you probably could actually go back to a law firm if you wanted to. And it's not like that very often in the market, but it's like that right now. So if you did want to go back, you could. In terms of mitigating the issue, I, I just think you just need to keep doing better and better work. And, and, and then and keep approving the quality and anything that you can find to make it even better then to, then do that. So the better you make your work, the better off you're going to be. So I don't think you're overthinking it. Uh, I, I think it's actually good from a growth perspective. I think it shows that, that this company really values the quality of the work and that the biggest problem that happens a lot of times when attorneys go in house is their skills deteriorate because they don't necessarily, the work isn't as high quality and, and they don't overlook their work and, and overlooking the work and so forth is really left to in-house counsel. So I, I think you'll, I think you'll actually be okay. Okay. Let's see here. I'm the stage of my career. Oh, here's a good one. So I, I do think it's a good thing to work in a company where uh, they're looking over your work very closely. And this is really what, one of the things that you know, most people, when they're in major firms, they dislike that, but it, it's a good thing. So where people are doing that. Okay. I'm at a stage in my career where I'm considering moving to my hometown in order to take advantage of better long-term prospects. That's smart. I would like some advice on what are my best options might be in terms of getting put a law firm on my problem. Okay. So the nice thing, when I move people, like people, when people move to your home market, the big thing about home market relocation is you should apply to every firm at once and every firm you'd want to, because you declining an option, an auction and you want to talk to everyone at once. So you want to talk to everywhere at once. You can, um, do the search on your own. You can use recruiter. It doesn't really matter, but you just need to find all the firms. This is something they do all the time. It's much easier to get a job when relocating home than it is if you're doing something in your own market. So it's a much easier type of search and it's typically you'll get more interviews and people are more likely to hire you because they're not suspicious. They're not suspicious uh, because if you're relocating, say you're in Chicago and you're moving firms in Chicago, the firms in Chicago are going to think maybe they're moving because things aren't going well with the current firm. So that's what I would do. You typically just, the, the idea is you apply to all the places that you'd want to work there at once. You do a lot of research, make sure you find all the firms. And then once you do find the firms, then make sure that you apply everywhere at once and then interview with the ones that interview you. And then, and then sometimes you can take the job right away. Other times you may not want to, but just do it that way. That's kind of how I would uh, recommend it. But I think a lot of times when people move home, they're, they're very happy. So I think if you're, if you have reasons, the other reason uh, I would say the reason, the other reason there's not a lot of suspicion, there's not a lot of suspicion, but there's also, they also believe that you will stay. Law firms like it if they think you're going to stay. And so that can be very helpful. Okay. How does the law firm? Okay. So this is a good question. So how does the law firm decide whether or not to create a full-time, part-time or contract position? So law firms will typically make that decision based on uh, a couple different factors, but the main one is, you know, how comp confident they are that they'll have ongoing work. Confidence and ongoing work. Um, so work uh, for clients. So if they, if they don't have the, the confidence, then uh, they'll typically make it a contract or part-time position and contract positions many times are for discrete projects that maybe they wouldn't want their attorneys doing on an ongoing basis or that are just you know, overflow or things like that. Same thing with a part-time. That's pretty much how they do that. So it's just confidence and ongoing work for clients. Full-time means there's going to be a lot of ongoing work. And then, and then typically the, you know, highest hiring standards for that. And then, then if they do contract to part-time lower, so it's just the confidence they don't want the, the thing is the law firm does not want to have to hire people and have to fire them or let them go because there's not enough work. And because if they do that, then it just looks bad to their people that are working there. It hurts morale, costs them unemployment insurance, and there's just all sorts of problems. So that was a great question. These are all really good questions. I'm really impressed with this audience today. I mean, this is probably honestly one of the best audiences questions I've had in a long time. Let's see here. Okay. My issue is almost the opposite. Hired a law school by a subsidiary firm that does lobbying work with it. Could actually became a dual timekeeper with the firm and build legal work. It is what I wanted to do and was very lucky to find a job in Georgia Law School. I did pass far out for me and dual timekeeper counsel was position. But the circumstances change over time the parties hiring and I bring legal respect did not have time to help me 
develop my own book of business for lobbying. So I left to COVID to do LLM and IP. Okay. I've sought advice from other attorneys and best market them the first, they all told me I need to decide if I want to be a real attorney, which yes, from my experiences, policymaking, political law, and I'm not sure how I got through to firms being five years out of law school without having a true position on my resume, something they understand. Okay. So that's a, a, a good, a, a good issue. So the, your practice area is government or, and you have to find positions in your practice area. There's always uh, positions in that practice area. If you look nationally and I understand what this position is. So you have to figure out a way to put that on your resume in, in a few letters and, and make sure that you're able to uh, communicate it. And so there's some things I like. The first thing is uh, you can definitely get it. Other law firms have the same jobs. Other law firms have the same job. You can get jobs with other law firms. You can get jobs with a sense of lobbyists and a lobbying organizations. So you're definitely employable. The, the, but my concern is this LLM. So the problem is the LLM is unrelated to what you're doing. And IP typically, in order to be good at IP, you have to have a hard sciences background. And no one's going to hire someone with five years of experience at IP in a political law to do IP. So they may but it wouldn't be a smart decision if they did. You have to position this on your resume in a smart way. And it just basically would be what I would do. Let's say the firm was uh, Smith's, I don't know, Smith Barnes. Barnes. So you would just say a uh, member of some council, it's attorney with subsidiary, whatever consulting, et cetera. And then just put that down. So you put the name of the big firm and then just put the attorney with the political subsidiary. And then the dates of employment and people will understand that. And then you did some description of what you did. This stuff with IP, I would just, I would just say that something along the lines of you wanted to take some time off during it, the firm ran out of work during the COVID, you decided to do something fun and learn about IP, but you're ready to go back. And that's what I would do, but you need to be very careful about anybody. And, and I'll, I'll say this. So I review resumes at BCG all day long. I don't know if a few applied in the, in the past, like it was the big thing is what I look for is really consistency of, uh, someone's experience. Cause if you have consistent experience, then there's going to be a firm somewhere that can probably hire you. We will want to hire you. But once you start doing multiple things and your experience isn't consistent, then it becomes much more difficult to get a job. Someone that does personal injury and then they go do uh, corporate and then they go do real estate, like that's inconsistent. And so law firms want to hire people that have a consistent experience, even if they're, you know, small law firms, most of them want that. So you just need to be careful about mixing things up and an LLM and government or something would have been interesting or lobbying, but I don't know why you did IP. If you might've just been interested and just say it was fun or and that, that's fine, but you just need to be careful about that. But I think you can, and I, of course I spelled lobbyist. Anyway, I'll have to work on that one later. Okay. Okay. Let's see. What are some of the biggest, this is a fun question. What are some of the mis biggest misconceptions that would be attorneys have about the field? Some of the biggest ones I think about the field that would be attorneys have that they're going to be generals and not soldiers. So when you, so typically when you see attorneys on television or when you think you're going to go somewhere and make a lot of money, you think that you're going to be able to be in control and have people are going to, and you're going to be important and stuff. And really most attorneys, even partners are more soldiers. They're deferential to clients and judges, clients, judges, even as partners. So most people are, are actually soldiers. I think that's one of the biggest ones. And then the other one is that they don't understand the stress levels that are involved. They don't understand that the, how high level work will impact relationships and health. They will impact relationships and health. They don't understand the, just how competitive peers are with each other. They don't understand how difficult it is to rise and succeed. They don't understand, you know, these are some of the things, the importance of getting business, the, if you're in a lot the lack of family contact and. There's a lot of things that are very difficult about the profession and I could talk about this forever, but then the money comes with a price. Money is a huge price and most attorneys, most people that go to law school could make more money doing other things. So those are some of the things. Oh, and then also they don't understand how competitive it is. There's just so many people competing for a limited amount of work. People are competing for a limited amount of work. I am going to work. So those are some of the biggest things. Uh, wow, look at these questions. These are just, you guys are superstars. This is absolutely freaking amazing. These are like really good, long questions. Okay. I've come to realize I don't fit on working on my own. So I'm considering open a solo practice instead of leaving law entirely. I have a few questions. If you can answer one, I greatly appreciate it. 
what are the risks? Okay. How do you start a capital? What type of service to offer clients? It was difficult for trades from. Okay. These are all great questions. Having, so there's, th there's books that I've, articles that I've written about starting your own practice. There's also some books out there. There's one, an old one by Jade Foonberg and that sort of thing. So you, in order to start your own practice, there's the risk are that you'll fail, of course. But honestly, if you learn how to build a website and learn how to write articles and things, and you should be able to get business. I don't think you need a lot for money to start and you can meet clients and all over. If you work alone, I know lots of attorneys that are very successful. They have immigration as one, trust in the states. Those are have also tax resolution uh, as another one. And those are very good practice areas to get into. Just one second, I have to grasp. Sorry about that. The other one I would say, uh, tax resolution is a good one. And then you also have uh, family law is another one. And any anything that's consumer facing, and by the way, you can make a lot of money doing these. And there's family law attorneys in Los Angeles charge you know, thousand dollars plus per hour. So you can definitely get into work and no, it's not difficult to find people to hire, but you have to have ongoing work first. So I know lots of attorneys that do these. I place people uh, all the time in these practice areas and you're better off trying to do practice areas where you're not competing against large law firms and, and or, or even or, very organized law firms, but all of these can do well. The other thing too is there's lots of online classes and things where you can learn how to do, or people teach people to do these type of practice areas where you can do all those things, learn how to do family law or tax revolution or how to set up trust in the states. Like trust in the states, there's things where you hold dinners and invite old people to them or even to plan their trust. And there's just, there's different things you can do to get jobs in each of those. And it's usually fairly, it, they're usually fairly easy. It's not uncommon by the way, for immigration attorneys trust I mean, to have multi-million dollar practices very quickly. I know lots of them. So I think opening your own practice can be very easy. There's also personal injury. You can do well with that. Um, an attorney that used to work for me did that. There's employment, plaintiff's employment work. So you have to decide what you want, but if those are all really good practices and I, I don't know how much startup capital you need, I would be careful. I don't think you really need a lot. I think you might've in the past when you needed offices and so forth, and you may need an office, but a lot of people will just work in offices where they share space. And, and so you can research, but if you do research online, you can find all sorts of classes and groups and things for people that teach you how to do these practice areas. And so it's really not that complex. Okay. Here's the other, is it too early to open your own practice when you have two to three years of practice experience? Absolutely not. I know people that open their own practice and were never able to get a job. And I know one woman that has a, a trust in the States or no, a immigration firm that does at least 5 million a year and she never got a job and she's four or five years out of law school. So you can do exceptionally well. You don't, if you have any practical experience, that's great, but you just need to throw yourself into it. And the thing is, if you're opening your own practice, you'll probably do much better than when you were in a law firm, because you'll be excited. You'll actually see the results of your work and your mistakes and will be much more excited. So you just, you want to choose a practice by the way, that, that other people um, are doing. So I had the strangest experience. I, I saw an attorney that I've known for 15 years and he's basically done, I don't know, he sold life insurance. He started a software company that, I don't know. And, but he started something where he was suing school districts for accommodations. I don't know, for, for accommodations, for learning disabled children or something, making a very profitable practice, education law. He just figured something out. So there's all sorts of practice areas you can find. You can do consider just it's very easy. You just have to have to research it. You can't just you have to say, does immigration interest you? Does trust in the states interest you? Does family law, does personal injury, does employment? You have to see what interests you. Accommodations. Still lose. Oh South Madus. Oh. My spelling's really off today. Yes, yeah, so you have to think about that. But yeah, you just throw yourself into it and you can do it. It's not a problem. Okay, let me just okay, these are great questions. This is such a good audience. I hope you guys come back every week, this particular audience. Some weeks since we don't get any good questions, so these are great questions. Okay. I have been practicing antitrust for a while, almost for 10 years at large law firms. And I feel the area is oversaturated. I agree. I consider becoming a solo practitioner and joining a boutique as a partner. I realize that antitrust is very dependent on sophisticated large law firms engaging in cross-border M&A instructions or high profile called trial members. What is your view on this? Yeah. So I've worked with a lot of trust and I trust people, and it's, it's actually very difficult to find jobs in any trust. And it, it's always for, it's not easy. If you join a boutique, then that's an, that there are lots of boutiques and you should research all the boutiques that do it. 
but you're right. Most of the work is dependent on large clients and the cases can go on for a long time. You need to be careful. The other thing you can do too many times is I know antitrust attorneys that have been recruited by companies that are being sued for antitrust to work in house. So that's one option. And then the, the skills of an antitrust litigator are related to general litigation and commercial litigation to some extent. It's a little bit more cerebral, obviously, but that's another thing to think about or working in the justice department, but you certainly won't make as much money. And so I, I think it's a tough practice area. I can tell you the reason I think antitrust is a tough practice area is just because I've worked with lots of very talented people. And in most cases, like they, that they're leaving because the work's slowing down. And then when we're trying to find them opportunities, there's just not a lot in the market. So that's something I would, I would be uh, concerned about. You can always find jobs. Some, there's some very active firms at Fresh Fields and Washington DC is very active, but there's, there's just a lot of places that are very active that have a lot of business, but, and then I don't, I'm just saying that's one firm I just would. Uh, placed a antitrust attorney recently, but I, there's there's just not as many um, opportunities, especially for senior antitrust attorneys, because billing rates are very high. The, the the work doesn't seem to be increasing, and that sort of thing. One thing I will say though is that the the work for an antitrust can many times be dependent on the administration. So the type of administration, is, who knows what will happen at this time. But I, I agree. I think I think that that it, it can be it's a difficult practice area. And if it was me, I probably would look at firms where I can do general litigation and contribute also to, to antitrust related work, but so I hope that helps. Okay. I fall in between two types of attorneys. It's just such great questions. Let's see here. You describe mildly passionate about my cases, which my client has truly been harmed and is blameless, which is rare in my years of experience. Yes, that's true. But I become disillusioned when I find the client's exaggerated position is not entirely blameless in the matter. What advice can you give as a practitioner with experience? So that's true. So you shouldn't become disillusioned. I, I think that you just, you want to frame facts in a way that appeals, that helps your client's best interest. And then you, you, you just need to sell yourself. On. And, and it was funny. I was talking, I was in a mediation once, um, I, I was with a well-known judge and he was talking about an attorney on the other side. And he was saying that, that this particular attorney that we're up against just regardless of what he's doing, just works himself up into such a white heat, getting all passionate about his client that he always wins. And, and it's true. You have to get all wrapped up in terms of what's going on with your clients and very enthusiastic. And the better you do that, the better off you'll be. So you just need to think about that. And, and most clients are not blameless. The truth is always somewhere in between, but your job is to take the side of the client. Let's see here. Whenever I have a setback, okay, this is actually a pretty good question. Whenever I have a setback, I often try to evaluate what went wrong and improve on it. What do you think about trying to learn from your successes or the mistakes of others, especially when a law firm and your colleagues quit or get no offers during the summers? Yeah, that's a great question. You, so there's, I, early in my career, when I was younger, I was a student of, um, Tony Robbins and then I worked with him for a while professionally, but he talks about something called modeling. You basically watch what successful people are doing. And you, you, you learn from it and you should watch what successful people are doing in every, in every firm or employer you're with. And, and you have to learn from the mistakes of others and every environment will show you where the mistakes lie. And, and a lot of times the best thing you can do, the smartest people, and so he, he has a book called Unlimited Power. It's pretty good to talk about that. Uh, he wrote it when he was maybe 20, it's probably 30 years old now, but. Um, he talks about modeling. I would read about that. The other thing I think that you can learn is, is the best people are the best listeners. The, the smartest students are typically the best listeners. I, I, I noticed that I, when I started in the, the legal placement in this, this business, I used to hire, I still do a lot of people from like Harvard and Stanford and Yale law schools, and, and they would come work here. And I always noticed that, that these people that were really good students compared to a lot of other people, certainly I didn't go to Yale law school and we're, we're very good listeners. I used to ask a lot of questions and listened. And, and I think that's a sign of people that are smart. It's a sign of people that are smart academically, but I also think it's a sign of people that are smart socially, because if you listen and you watch, then you'll learn. And so I believe that's just staying back and, and not getting involved in things many times can help. And uh, just another funny thing that happened, I, I was in this thing in college and, and then when it came time after to um, nominate a, someone to be president of it. The person that ultimately got the position was the one that had never upset anyone and everyone else had been very taking sides and arguments and stuff. And this person always just sat on the sidelines. And I thought that was interesting. Yeah, let's see here. I know what employers are looking for. Yeah, let's see. Here. Question. I know employers are looking for you. We'll stick with it. But from the outside, it seems like large firms really don't seem to care much with them. 
for associates plan to be there for the long haul. Do large law firms really care about how long associates intend to stay when they are hired? Yes, they do. They, but the thing is that the law firms now at this day and age look at if you leave, it's just a cost of doing business and they're frustrated, but large law firms do want you to stay. It's actually very good for their clients and they'll put you in higher and more uh, important roles, the more likely they think you are to stay and they'll, you'll work with more important partners and you'll work on more important matters and you'll be closer to the action uh, because they don't like the turnover and because it, it actually costs their clients money when you get up to speed and it doesn't look good. Law firms do want you to stay. They, as long as they need you. So as your billing rates get higher, you'll be more competitive with partners and the, there's all sorts of issues related to that. But Law firms definitely want you to stay. They And they do care about how long you'll stay when they're hiring. And they want you to uh, stay if, if you can. But but the problem is a lot of times they're, they're so frustrated that they the people leave so much that, that it doesn't seem like it many times. And they often do become impersonal and they believe that, that, that you won't, that you may not, that you'll leave. But they do care about how long you'll stay. And something that was interesting to me, I was at, when I was at a firm, I remember at, I was at a cocktail party and one of the associates was uh, making fun of one of the partners. See, no one makes partner here. And the partner said, that's because everyone leaves. All you need to do to be partner is stay. And if you stay, do you make partner, which I thought was part and, and it's probably true. So if you stay, once you leave, then you, everything's off the table. And, but if you stay, we have a lot better options. Okay. Here's another question. These are great. I'm a rising three health and a very bad experience. Let me just seek her. Big law position to major market. I've been disappointed with my firm's supervision, mentorship, and work assignments. Okay. There are probably some things I can do as a program wraps up to rather for turn offer, but I'm feeling very burnt and wouldn't take an offer even if I received it. I have two federal clerkships lined up after graduating and will graduate with some honors from a school that tends to place very well everywhere. So I feel my job prospects are pretty good. Is there any reason why I should gun really hard to get an offer? Yes, that's great. You have these clerkships. So you can basically say that they weren't making offers for people two years in the future and because most firms won't, by the way, they may tell you that when it comes time to get an offer that they're not in the, in interested in making offers to people that aren't going to be working for the next two, because they can't know what's going to, what things are going to be like in two years. But I don't, I think your job prospects are very good afterwards. I would say that, that, that again, we talk, you're talking about the supervision, mentorship and work assignments. You need to get over all this because you're working for someone and they're, they're paying $20,000 a month or whatever their, the pay is these days and then, you know, but you need to, you, you can't, you're probably working at a big firm that's been around, will be around another hundred years and this stuff's not going to change and it's not going to be much different anywhere. So you need to figure out how to like it. And, and because you go to a good law school and you've got these clerkships, you've done well, you, you shouldn't have the sense of entitlement. If you have that, you're going to get blown out of the water. Now you'll probably get that corrected in your clerkships, but you just need to be careful. And I'm not, and you deserve to feel proud of yourself and to work at a firm where you're getting the right things. But, but again, you're working in an environment where you're expected to, you're expected to work and try to get mentors and you're expected to work on getting hard to get assignments. So you have to be out there. One of the things that big law teaches is they, that you, to, you, you have to, in many places, you have to go and chase work and you have to do what you can to get the best assignments and you have to try to work to get the best mentors and stuff. You have to actually try to imp impress them and, and, and do what you can. So you need to change a little bit about how you're thinking. Now, my thought is that you probably went to a very good, you're going to a good law school, you're doing well, and you, you want to feel valued and important and stuff, but you're, you're expected to, you're, it's like going to the Olympics. You, you can't, you can't expect, you know, really good treatment just because you're in the Olympics. You have to, you have to step up and then you're, now you're in a more competitive field. You have to be more, you have to put up with work harder to get mentors and work harder to get good assignments and all that stuff. And that's just how it works. And, and, and I, I made a similar mistake the first half of my first summer, I would work on getting an offer. If you don't get an offer, then, then the idea is that you're probably going to, it, you're going to be asked that probably. And if you say you did it, people are going to think there's something wrong and some firm have sour grapes about the will like that. But for the most part, I don't think it's going to matter two years or three years from now is a long time. And you'll be a different person after two clerkships. And you may even, I don't know if you're doing an appellate clerkship as well, but you may have run into an appellate clerkship after that. Okay. Got one more question here. Thank you for that question, by the way. It's a very good question. And I hope for your sake that it works out. I have a degree in chemistry. 
what type of employers are attracted to social. So you can go back to a, a law firm from a solo. You just need to have skills. I've seen most of the people that go back to law firms have skills in like immigration, a trust in the states and consumer facing practice areas. And so that is really the, kind of the main thing. But yeah, you can, you can definitely enter the practice after having a solo practice and enter a law firm if you're doing the right kind of work. Yeah, the law firms will always hire you if you have the experience and yeah, so that shouldn't be too much of a problem. And it's more difficult many times to go into a company, but especially if you do a good job as a solo and you're impressing people on the market that you're in or wherever you're in, a lot of those attorneys may hire you in the future. Okay. Thank you everyone for your questions. I loved all these questions today. I was extremely impressed and I appreciate everyone being on the presentation and I will talk to everyone next week.